The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or when you use our code themomhour at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. Hi, I'm Megan. And I'm Sarah. We're two moms with eight kids between us from preschool to teen. This is the show where we help you feel better about the mom you are and share our own parenting tips and personal stories. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to The Mom Hour, and I am Sarah Powers. It's just me today because this is one of our episodes in The Mom Hour Voices interview series. And in a couple of minutes, I'll be joined by my guest today, Leslie Miller from the Coffee and Crumbs podcast. Leslie is a mom of three little ones, as well as a writer and podcaster. If that sounds familiar, it's because she and I have a lot in common about our motherhood stories and kind of the trajectory they've taken. So I can't wait for you to hear my conversation with Leslie from Coffee and Crumbs. We are welcoming our longtime sponsor, Prep Dish, back to the show today. And listeners, if you're looking to boost your protein intake, Prep Dish is making it so easy right now. When you sign up in January, you'll get access to a month's worth of the new Prep Dish protein boost meal plans. I love this, Sarah. Protein is so important for our health. It helps support mental clarity, sleep, energy, hormone balance, and more. And as busy moms, we're often not getting enough protein, especially at breakfast. With these meal plans from Prep Dish, you'll learn how to quickly prep four protein-rich dinners and one breakfast. Right. And like all Prep Dish meal plans, they make it so simple to shop once, prep for the week ahead of time, and save time on busy weeknights by having your meals ready to heat and serve. And Megan, these meals sound so delicious and perfect for January. Listen to this slow cooker carnitas bowls, stuffed pepper soup, and then there's a Swiss chard mushroom and goat cheese frittata for breakfast. Okay, I am adding that stuffed pepper soup to my rotation ASAP. This is a limited time offer, so make sure to sign up before the end of January to get your free bonus meal plans. To learn more and sign up now, visit prepdish.com slash themomhour. Again, that's prepdish.com slash themomhour for a month's worth of the new Prep Dish Protein Boost meal plans. Check it out. Sarah, you know when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies, but having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. Okay, guys, let's get right into my conversation with Leslie Miller from the Coffee and Crumbs podcast. Leslie, welcome to the Mom Hour. Thanks for having me, Sarah. I'm so excited to finally get to chat with you I on know, your show. I'm, I know I'm really excited <laughs> about this too. So for our listeners who don't know you, um, just tell us a little bit about your family, where your kids are in their ages um, and where you guys live and a little bit, just introduce us to you. Sure. So I'm married to Jonathan and we have been married for 12 years this summer and we have our home now in Santa Barbara. We actually met here and fell in love here in Santa Barbara and then left for a number of years and then found our way back, which uh, we love because we were always hoping to to return back here. So we had our first two kids in Sacramento. Anna is now six and Owen is now four. And then uh, we've had our third baby when we were here in Santa Barbara, Luke, and he is one. 
Well, if this is sounding kind of familiar to our listeners, <laughs> I grew up in Santa Barbara and you and I have some fun parallels between us. So I grew up in Santa Barbara. You grew up down here where I live now in Orange County and we've kind of swapped. Yes. Crazy. Yes. Um, and then also our kids' ages are really similarly spaced. So I am just about three, three and a half years ahead of where you are. Um, and so we've had fun talking about that as we've gotten to know each other and on the Coffee and Crumbs podcast when I was your guest. So I think this will be really fun for our listeners because I think our listeners actually have kids probably more your kids age, a, a lot of them anyway. So this will be really fun. Um, so Anna is six, you said. Um, and I want to start with talking a little bit about back to school. We're recording this in September. So school is on a lot of mom's minds, but not everybody, because wouldn't you agree that before you have school age kids, September is just kind of another month. Oh yeah. It's just like any other month in the year. And it's funny because I remember until last year, whenever I saw all of the back to school ads and, you know, just the whole back to school push, everybody's photos online. It was like, I couldn't really relate because it had been so long since yeah. I had actually gone back to school. So it just kind of felt like we lived in this eternal summer for yeah. a number of years. Yeah. And then now, you know, we actually are in that rhythm and season. Yeah, so in that rhythm. So tell me, um, your six and four year olds, what's their school situation? right now. So they, Anna is in first grade and she's going to a little Christian private school that's near our house. And okay. she started there last year as a kindergartner and um, she's there until two forty five every day. Okay. And then my preschooler, Owen, is at the preschool at our church that we attend and okay. he goes two mornings a week. Okay. And actually I keep saying mornings, but this year it's actually longer. He's there for their full day from oh. um, about eight, eight fifteen is when I drop him off to about three o'clock. So oh. I actually actually chose to do it that way this yeah. year because of the drop-off pickup schedule yes. with our other kids. So, well, let's talk about this a little, because I know we have a lot of listeners whose kids are starting preschool. Was your preschool pretty flexible about like half day, full day, every day, three days a week? I remember thinking yes. when I had my first child going in that there was like a formula that everybody followed, like when your child was three. And I should say, I'm kind of talking to stay at home moms in this particular case not right. not all our listeners are but if you've been home with your little ones um so I remember thinking okay well when they're three they do Tuesday Thursday morning and when they're four the following year they do Monday Wednesday Friday and then they go to kindergarten and I, I it took me a while to realize like there's like everywhere in between so how, oh, yeah. how did that work for you guys yeah. how did you know what you wanted from that preschool schedule that that is such a great question and this is something that I feel like I've tried to bring up to moms that are in that two-year-old three-year-old stage yeah. and they're trying to think about preschool because I just didn't really ask enough questions when I was in that stage. I felt like eh, it's preschool, like preschool is preschool and we'll just pick a preschool and go. And I, I just didn't ask a whole lot of questions because I thought like you that it followed kind of that same, you know, two day a week, three day a week sort of right. thing. And a lot of schools do, but a lot of schools don't. Right. And I actually really regret because I, I felt like I made a mistake with Anna's um, three year old year of preschool okay. because I didn't do a whole lot of research. And we ended up having her at a school that it was it was a great little school but it was really catered towards um, full-time stay-at-home mom moms. And I had just really gotten on a good work schedule where I needed consistent childcare. And right. it, the school wasn't a great fit in terms of their flexibility for how they could fit various members of our family's needs. And so right. by that, I mean, like you couldn't send your two-year-old, you, you know, you had to be three and mm -hmm. you had to be potty trained and you had to go for these specific hours that from, were from about eight to 1230. And that was it. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like after that, that first year of schooling for her, that I needed a preschool that had more options and that we could choose which days of the week worked for us. And I, you know, because I work, I felt like, well, I don't want her there Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because a lot of times Mondays and Fridays are holidays. Yeah. And then, then my work day is gone. So yeah. I really, if I'm going to have her there, it needs to be either Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Tuesday, Thursday, but I will do anything to avoid those Monday Fridays because I feel like I'm paying for time right. that I don't oftentimes right. get. So I've been very strategic about choosing a preschool that just really can work with our family and the preschool where they, they are at is, I would say it's kind of like a, a preschool slash daycare. I mean, they right. have extended, extended yeah. day hours and some families are there till, you know, six at night or yeah. they drop off at seven in the morning. So 
No, that, 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 that works for us. bring up so many good points. I have actually always been at preschools. I guess we've only had two preschools. We lived in Arizona until my oldest was uh, after her kindergarten year. So she went through all of her preschool years in Arizona. My middle started preschool in Arizona and did his second year here in California. And then I have a, my third is in preschool here. So in our two preschools, both were very geared toward working families. And I was actually more on the stay at home or work a little from home track. Um, but it was... Yes, you're so right that you can get more strategic and know what you need. But when you're brand new to it, you don't always know that those are even an option. And actually, no. like side tip for moms is like the front office of your preschool may not even say that something is an option. They might not put it on their website. I know our preschool right now really is geared toward working families and doesn't offer a lot of part-time solutions. They do offer mornings, but they encourage three days a week right from the beginning, even for three-year-olds, even if you're a stay-at-home mom. And I had a friend who I said, just ask, because we had been there a couple of years. And I said, just ask if they'll do two days, two mornings a week. She just wanted two mornings a week and she really wanted this school. And of course they did it, you know? So yeah. it's, it's kind of like when you're new to it, you don't realize like everything is an option. Um, yes. So I think that's such a good point. So, and the other yeah. thing I wanted to follow up on about Luke is you have a full day of preschool, which isn't that kind of amazing if you've done half days. Yes. So it is amazing because, um, they nap them there. And I mean, he's still, he's still napping. He's four and he's still napping at home. Sometimes, sometimes he doesn't, but it's just nice to feel like, um, I still have that nap time hour here at home that I can get yes. stuff done because they're watching him at school. Yes. And then I can just pick up both of the, the kids at the same time instead of living in my minivan yes. already, which I know is inevitable and yeah. in some ways is happening way more yeah. than it used to be. But I still am like, if I can avoid having to leave the house at noon, yeah. one o'clock and two o'clock, you know, yeah, that that's really helpful. So. And I think four is a great year. I, all of my kids did half days when they were three and then they've all done something slightly different in that four four-year-old like pre-k year but um I really think that that's a great year to start playing around with the full day school schedule it's not like if they don't get it before kindergarten they'll still be fine kindergartners are mm -hmm. tired no matter what even if they've yeah. been <laughs> prepped but if you have the option to do even a couple days of week to get them used to that full day schedule I think it's so nice and it's so nice for you to, because yeah. Like, yeah like you said the 8 30 to noon goes by really fast it goes by really <laughs> fast especially if you're picking up because I mean my situation right now is that my youngest is not preschool age right. and so we have him at a separate location he's at an in-home daycare two okay. mornings a week and so I have about <laughs> roughly like eight hours of child care with him being covered right um and he he's there with Nancy and she's wonderful and loves him so well and we've you know just really enjoyed that spot for him um but there are you know I have three kids at three different yeah. locations yeah. so I'm oh sometimes gosh. I'm I'm spending the money that I'm spending on childcare, I'm using it to drive back and forth yes. to drop kids off at various places. Yeah. So you really got to be strategic yes. with, yes. you know, how you're doing things. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about, I want to know what, what is different about being a quote unquote school mom? Now that you're a couple years into elementary school and you've done the preschool thing a couple of times, what's different about this phase of life maybe than you imagined? And this could be like, it could be schedule wise. It could be how much you are enjoying it or not enjoying it. But what what, what feels different than maybe you expected it to be about this phase? You know, a couple of things feel surprising. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that feels the most surprising this particular fall is that I really miss having Anna around. Mm -hmm. And that surprised me. I, I feel it sounds funny to say that I miss, you know, having my kid around. Of course, in some ways, of course, of course, that's the case. But in other ways, I always felt like when they were really young and I still have two that are really young, it was right. like, well, once they're at kindergarten and first grade, it's going to feel like such a relief. And right. it does feel like a relief in some ways that I can go grocery shopping with just two of them right. or just one of them some days. But in other ways, it just feels like she's gone a long time. And when she comes back at three and we're scrambling to do a soccer practice or some homework, it just feels like there's not a whole lot of time to just snuggle or give her a hug or just yeah. those natural moments that we had when she wasn't in school all day. Yeah. So I'm, I was, I've been surprised by that. I've just how much it's just a long day for both of us for yeah. her and I yeah um so that's that's one thing and then I guess the other thing is just feeling like I've really stepped into that I don't know how the, how else to put it other than like legit mom status yeah. so <laughs> totally know what you mean. it's like I think I was thinking about it and trying to figure out why why is that the case and my only theory is like I don't have any memories of my own childhood between really the ages of zero and four I mean those yeah. you just don't remember a whole lot and so when I think about my own mom and mothering 
me, it's yeah. from when I was in like elementary school are those most formative years. So now to have an elementary schooler and to yeah. realize like I'm doing all the things that my mom, I have got the minivan and we're yeah. doing the soccer practice and like I'm doing all these legit mom things. And like, how did this happen? I went from baby toddler mom to yeah. a mom of an elementary schooler. And I it's think- just different. I think that is such a good point. And I think you're really, I think that's really true is a lot of it has to do with our own memories and maybe a little bit of like TV and movies and media too. Cause I feel like there's a little bit clearer cliche out there about like the mom of elementary schoolers than maybe there is about mom of tiny little kids. Um, Mm -hmm. So maybe that's some of it too, but I think, I so think you're right. So on that note, have you, did you find it intimidating at all going into let's talk about like the elementary school years because it can't I found it intimidating like everything from being expected to volunteer to joining PTA to like seeing these other moms for me it put me right back in new mom phase where like Mm -hmm. you think everyone else has it figured out and we all learn that they don't but you just thought they did I find that that happens again sometimes especially going into the elementary school years because the schools are bigger they have systems and it seems like the other moms know how everything works and have their you know what together and Mm -hmm. you're kind of right back down at the bottom of the pecking order did you go through that at all yeah a little bit last year especially and and still this year too because it's the first year she's doing a full day her kindergarten was till noon and so now she's yeah so um there's a mom that I just love and her she has I think her oldest is maybe in fifth grade so they've been at the school for a while and she'll see me and just give me little tips like roll down your window you're in the wrong lane for carpool or like if you really want to get her quickly you need to park right there that's the spot you know and I just appreciate that like someone's totally. taking care of me because I don't know what I'm doing um so it's it's just very it's definitely very different um from from preschool and the preschool years I think that Um, I just feel the weight of like that it's real school and the accountability that exists now that has, has never existed before Yeah. in terms of, you know, the only other person really checking in on us from the age of baby to five was your pediatrician, you know, and kind of check in the growth charts once a year and are they doing all the things they're supposed to be doing. But now we have someone checking in, you know, watching her and there's things that are due. And so it just feels like that's, there's a, there's a little bit of a weight to that and definitely a lot more paperwork and dates yes. and schedules and Same. activities and things, um, yes. play dates and all of that. It just feels like I'm managing. I'm more of like the family manager than I ever have been. Yeah. So I think that's, and I, I found it most challenging when I only had one in that world and two who weren't, and it's gotten easier and easier and easier. The more that that just is my, so now I have two in elementary school, one in the final year of preschool. Um, and so it feels easier, I think, when that's my whole world rather than hmm. all of a sudden your oldest is there and it just hasn't been. It's a little jarring. Yeah. Um, well, that makes sense even just because I, I do feel like I'm still split between baby phase, yeah. preschool phase and now elementary school phase. Totally. We're in three very different phases of our children's lives. And that just yeah, there's just a lot of various needs going on all the time. Agreed. So I also had a baby when my oldest was in kindergarten, which was your situation last mm-hmm. year. Um, And I pretty much, I I was lucky. We were at a small charter school in Arizona. It was very nurturing. I felt really great about the teacher. And I think Violet was, she would have been about seven months when the school year started. So she wasn't a brand new baby, but you know, Mm -hmm. seven months to a little over a year over the course of that kindergarten year. But I pretty much didn't, I didn't do much volunteering or like I was not, I didn't go to the Friday flag salute. I just kind of gave myself permission to not, but I, I know yeah. other moms really struggle with that um, and almost do the opposite, which is prioritize the kindergartner or the elementary schooler and make sure that childcare is handled for the baby. I, hmm. I don't know why it just felt easier for me to be like, good luck in kindergarten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're, you're an easy kid. Your teacher seems great. I, I'm out. <laughs> like, you're fine. <laughs> you know, but I, I'm, I'm curious if that has come up with you since you do have a little one at home have you felt kind of yeah. the pressure to volunteer or just not not pressure necessarily but just the desire to be in two places at once yeah well yes if if I had it my way I would have picked you, what you did yeah. which was like essentially there's plenty of years to be in the kindergarten classroom I have two more children that exactly. are going to be coming through so like let's just slow down and not be <laughs> over eager like that would be my, my advice to anyone listening is if you have multiple children there's plenty of time yeah um we are at a school that requires us to volunteer so uh-huh. we're at um a private school and they to keep tuition costs down and to make it affordable for families mm-hmm. um, every family has 
has to volunteer depending on the number of kids you have. So we have six volunteer hours that we have to do per month. And when we said yes to the school and decided that was what we wanted to do for Anna, um, I honestly, I didn't weigh what volunteering would look like or really even consider that as a factor. Um, when we were deciding what to do. Right. And then once the school year started and I realized, oh, I have a newborn right. and two other kids and I'm supposed to be volunteering. I mean, how am I going to yeah. do this? And it was a huge source of stress for me last yeah. year. And fortunately, fortunately, you could choose to pay for those hours if you couldn't be okay. there. So we could, you know, pay a certain yeah. amount, buy out. which yeah. you could buy out, which yeah. kind of makes sense. Cause if yeah. the other alternative is to get a babysitter, well yeah. then, you know, it's like, like it kind of made sense. So yeah. we kind of each month we would do like half of our yeah. hours or, you know, four of the hours and then pay for the others because it was just very, it was very stressful. So this year is different with her in first grade. Um, I am choosing to use an hour of my work time each week to be in the classroom. And I'm actually helping teach, teaching Spanish, which is really funny because I only know basic Spanish. So, which, you know, is all, it's all you need to know if you're teaching basic Spanish. First, I know more than they do. I love that. So, um, yeah, it takes time to kind of figure out what your role is. Um, so I love that. Well, we're going to move on from school stuff, but any other little tips or advice for moms who maybe are just starting out um, with a new preschool or a new elementary school this year? Any words of encouragement? I would say just to be careful with the number of commitments that you take on, whether it's volunteering or whether it's just other um, volunteer. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be even volunteering at school. A lot of times moms, stay at home moms are involved with other committees or things at church or whatever. And I was overcommitted last year and just nearly cost me a you know yeah. nervous breakdown that might be a little little bit of an exaggeration but I was stressed out really stressed out yeah. so be careful with how many commitments you it's take on so much easier to fill up that time than it is to unfill it once yes. you're committed and I love what you said about there being there's time for all of that if you're at the very beginning um, with my kids where they are I am starting to take on more volunteer roles and stuff but this is years in my oldest is in fourth grade so I kind of feel like I'm paying it forward to the moms who are saying no because they have a full-time job and a baby at home and whatever else I feel like Mm -hmm. I'm now in a position to free them up I wish I could find one and just say look you don't have to do anything this year because I was you and I didn't do anything that year I can so we can all you know opt in and out as makes sense so yeah I think the other thing I would say too is just like to be open-minded about school options for your kids too. And we talked about that a little bit yeah. with, with preschool, but just to be, to, to talk to people and to be open-minded about, you know, weighing private school, public school, charter school, all of yes. those things. And, um, you know, you might, you might be surprised at where you end up with I each totally of your kids. Agree. And I bet you and I are similar, Leslie, in that sometimes we decide what we've like figured out before we've really thought through everything. Cause we've, you know, done the homework, checked the boxes and like, okay, this is what we're doing. And then sometimes it takes a learning experience like you had with preschool to be like, Oh, there are some things I maybe could have considered. So I, yes. think, that's, I think that's great advice. Also for our yep. listeners, I will link up in the show notes, Megan and I did an episode a long time ago about choosing schools and between Megan and me, I think we've had every homeschool, charter school, private school, like literally everything. So listeners who want to go back and listen to more of this type of conversation, that was a good one. And I will link it up in the show notes. So, um, okay, so let's move on. We're going to kind of keep going with this idea of balance and stuff, but let's talk about your creative and work life. Um, and I know you a little bit, but our listeners don't. So tell everybody kind of what that looks like for you. You're home with your kids, but you work some. Um, so tell everybody what that work is and maybe about how many hours per week or what that looks like. Sure. So yes. So I have, I'll start with, I mentioned earlier, I have about eight hours of paid childcare for Luke, which means that a lot of the work that I do happens in those hours or it happens on the evenings and weekends, which is kind of the case for any woman that works part-time for home or has a flexible job. My jobs have looked very different year to year right now. I would say that my, probably my full-time work is uh, the podcast Mm -hmm. and several little side projects with writing. So contributing to coffee and crumbs and doing a little bit of freelance writing here and there, but for the most part, it's the podcast. And, um, I, 
have, I'm trying to think of some of the other things that I've done in the last few years, but I've kind of, I've done everything from contributing to books to working as a magazine editor to doing freelance for nonprofits and corporate organizations. And the podcast has been kind of just a, a fun, what started as a fun hobby has now become kind of a, yeah. a job. So I think that one of the things that has surprised me the most about really since I had kids and have done a lot of different things is that every season has looked very different. Yes. Um, especially after I've had each baby, I've changed my mind about things or yeah. had to rework my, my schedule. So the podcast has been, has been great. Uh, yeah. It's so funny how similar like our backgrounds are in this regard with like writing, turning into podcasting. Would you say like how many hours would you say as the, as things have, have ebbed and flowed over the years, have you been going out to find work to fill a part-time schedule or have you sort of been responding to opportunities that come to you and saying yes or no, depending on if you have the bandwidth? Um, both. Okay. I would say I will, you know, we've been, we've been talking about this a lot. Ashley and I've been talking about this a lot because we want to do an episode at some point about women that work part-time from home. Mm -hmm. And in that conversation, as I've been kind of thinking it, I'm realizing like I'm speaking out of a huge place of privilege because yes. I'm in the position where my husband works a full-time job that is able to cover our family needs and finances. Um, and so that, I mean, I just have to say that first for yes. women that are listening because yep. it doesn't feel fair not to. I agree. Um, that said, it would be a lot easier for us to live in the expensive beach town that we live in if I was working full time. So there is some sacrifices that we've also chosen to make in order for me to pursue creative work rather than doing the work that I was doing before I had kids, which was working in marketing, mm -hmm. which would be more lucrative and would be more consistent in terms of hours. Right. So. I think that um, in some ways it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that I'm doing what I'm doing. And yet there's a creative side of me that just, I think wouldn't be fulfilled and mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to be home with my kids and enjoy mm -hmm. them as much as I do if I didn't have a way and an outlet to pursue the millions of ideas that are always going through my brain. I just, I always have new ideas I'm wanting to try and pursue um, in the, in all these variety of mediums, blogging and writing and podcasting or, you know, starting companies or whatever. So we've done a lot of different creative things. And one of the things that we also do right now in order to kind of help supplement my, you know, little meager artist salary is mm -hmm. that we own a side business that is not related to my creative work at all. And okay. I manage that a couple okay. hours each week. And it's kind of like semi-passive income mm -hmm. that, um, that really allows me to kind of do what we do. So I guess the, the long story short is we've tried to be really creative and be okay with making some sacrifices in order for me to pursue this work. And sometimes the work has come easily to me and I have mm -hmm. felt like the magazine position, for instance, and it was mm -hmm. amazing and I loved it and it made decent money. And then the magazine folded and it was done. And then I was in a place where I was having to go out and look for, for work. Right. And so um, it's really been, to be quite honest, a very emotional process over the last mm -hmm. five or six years where sometimes it's been the highest of highs. And I've also had just the lowest of lows when it comes to my creative work. Well, I so appreciate a bunch of things about what you just said. I, um, Megan and I have also said on this podcast before that sort of, you know, the disclaimer of privilege that everybody's coming f to their work life motherhood balance from a different place. And we have mm -hmm. listeners who work full time who wish they didn't have to. We also have listeners who are home full time who really would like to have something more, more income and more fulfillment. So we just honor everybody's place of where they're coming from. And I'm in the same position as you. I've had the privilege of figuring out what a flexible work life looks for me over the last several years. Um, and it is, it, it does come from a place of privilege and it can create, it is almost more pressure in some ways to figure out like, okay, well now this is taking me away from my kids, maybe more than I'm like, I'd like, do I scale back or do I get mm -hmm. used to it? So, you know, it's so, yes. there's so <laughs> much gray area. So I just appreciate your honesty and yeah. everything you just said about that. And I just relate to so much. Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, <laughs> right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. 
I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids' diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar, they have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them, and I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution. Haya, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash mom hour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Okay, I'm back with Leslie from the Coffee and Crumbs podcast, and we're talking about creative work and work that we do from home um, and all of the great things that come along with that and some of the challenges. I'm curious, Leslie, you said that you always have a million ideas, um, and I'm curious what you, how you handle seasons of life, like right after a new baby or just when everything is full up, when, when the quantity of ideas exceeds the bandwidth for real them. Are you a journaler? <laughs> Do you have like creative colleagues that you can brainstorm with? I know this is um, this is a challenge for a lot of women. It is. And yes, I always have way too many ideas and not enough basically not enough child care time is what it comes down to. <laughs> it's not not enough time. It's not it's enough not time enough where time. the yeah. children are not here. <laughs> where they're, that. There, they're not here. And the hardest part with that is that I would consider myself an introvert and I would say that I am just in my own head a lot. Mm-hmm. So it is not uncommon for me to all of a sudden snap at the kids and yeah. they all look at me kind of like, why did you just snap at me? And I realize, oh, it's because I'm, I've totally been sitting here just thinking through like yeah. what my next essay is going to be about or what the next big idea is. And so I do have to find systems and ways to kind of um, write those things down or put some of them aside or know when the appropriate time is to brainstorm them with someone else because I can quickly just be very lost in my own thoughts. Mm -hmm. So yes, I have all kinds of notes on my cell phone and my notes section that I'm writing things down with big question marks of do I want to pursue this or not. And I would say um, there's a couple different groups of women writers, Mm -hmm. the coffee and crumbs writers being one. And then I'm in a group called the red bed writers guild. And those are two, two groups that I feel like I have really have been very beneficial to me and that I've used for their ideas and talents and resources and just bouncing ideas off to kind of figure out what to do next. So, and, and there have been times where I have come up with ideas and mentioned them to someone and very lovingly, they have said, that sounds like a great idea, but I don't think that you have the time for that. Or I don't think that that's something that you should pursue right now. I have said that to people before. Um, I tend to be, uh, I, I, I think of myself as not as ambitious. Like I tend to be someone who hunkers down and can get really 
uh, immersed in the details of what's already on my plate. If anything, mm-hmm. I tend to overdo, overperform on what's already on my plate. So I don't have the um, creative ambition problem that a lot of creative people do. Um, but just having been around so many people like that, I definitely, I relate to those conversations where it's like, this might be for another time, another, yeah. <laughs> another season. Um, yeah. I love that. What about, I'm curious, a lot of our listeners have shared with us that they feel like there's something creative that they want to be doing and they're not sure what that will look like for them um I know you're a writer and I'm a writer so for me like if I were to do more of something that's probably what it would be um Mm -hmm. but has is has this come up for you or do you ever like have ideas that are not even writing or podcasting related like you want I know you recently ran a race or you know knit a blanket or yeah you or or is that on your radar at all for other women um yeah, I feel like there's always, I mean, because even the podcast, um, I would consider myself a writer first and right. foremost, but yet I'm spending the majority of my time right now podcasting. And I think what's interesting to me about that is that um, in, so, in some ways it was a very conscious choice because I felt like for me as a writer, I need big, big chunks of time to actually make progress. I wish that wasn't the case. I wish I was someone that could just spend 10 minutes and jot down my thoughts and then pick it back up 10 minutes, you know, later and not be okay with interruption, but that's just not the case for me. And so because of our current work life children's schedule, it feels like podcasting is a better fit because I can fit 10 minutes in here and 10 minutes in there, but I'm still able to be creative with, um, yeah, I'm still I'm still able to use my creativity. Yeah. And it just looks a little different, I guess. Yeah. No, I so. love that. And sometimes those things come to us in a fortunate way. Um, I, I love that the Internet is allowing for Facebook groups and just networking groups and creative collections of people who just want to be creative. I feel like this is sort of a newer idea of creativity as just a general life value and not mm-hmm. like one particular um, pursuit photography or writing or you know what I mean so I think that's I think that's a good thing for moms out there who want to be creative and aren't sure how yet yeah yeah I think that we tend to sometimes think of creativity as like crafts or at least that's mm-hmm. what comes to mind to me yeah. first is like oh if you're creative then you're like a really crafty person or you're able right. to you know make your house look really nice but creativity looks so so different from person yes. to person I agree so what's the best part about being involved the in the work you do the podcasting the writing what's the what's the thing that you just love when you get up in the morning and have a work day ahead of you Uh, I think that it's being able to use a side of my brain um, and heart that I don't get to use with my kids, which seems so simple, but I think that I love being able to see um, thoughts come across the paper on the screen that make cohesive sense and that at the end of the day, that project is done and it stays done, whereas so much with motherhood gets undone day after day. And so it feels like to be able to, to take this swarm of thoughts and ideas in my head that's always been there since I was little and is going, going, going and actually get it out somehow and be able to look at it and see it being done. There's some kind of satisfaction there that I that I need so I love that I love that that's a great great answer what about what's the hardest part we've kind of touched on a few maybe but yeah probably the the guilt that can come with pursuing my passions when there are so many needs around here and the guilt that can come that a lot of times my passions don't make a lot of money but we have children that we need to pay for childcare. And so there's always that balance with figuring out like, is it really worth it? What I'm trying to pursue here. Um, and then, you know, because of that and trying to be mindful of the fact that, you know, the kids need me and are young, I, I do end up working a lot evenings and weekends. And so sometimes I can feel really stretched way, way, way too thin. Yes. Which I'm sure you can relate to. I totally can. And I, I can't remember which, but recently on an episode, um, Oh, Megan and I were talking about kind of back to school being like the new year, like happy new year for moms. Cause we're Mm -hmm. all kind of have new goals and just, I was just really honest that my, my mothering job has gotten easier and easier because my kids are getting older and I have been relentless about filling that with more and more work, which in the beginning was really fun and engaging. And, you know, also just 
it coincided with the growth of the business that Megan and I are building. But at the same time, I'm like, well, now I have kids in school quite a bit and I am working every single minute that they are out of the house. And I never really stopped to like evaluate that and say like, is this what, is this what I wanted? So Mm -hmm. it is where, you know, when you're fitting it in and nap times and evenings and weekends, there is, I mean, it's like the cliche, but there's no clocking out. It's just always there. And so it's yeah. very easy for that to to fill every available empty space, I guess, is one of the challenges for me. Because for so long, there wasn't very much empty space. So mm-hmm. I had to use every second. And now there's more. And I'm like, oh, maybe. Maybe <laughs> I don't have to fill yeah. every second. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. Well, I want to shift to talking about coffee and crumbs, which, of course, we've, you know, alluded to. But let's, let's talk a little bit more. So for our listeners who aren't all ready readers and listeners um i have followed the coffee and crumbs brand and read essays on the website for a while now but just recently megan and i got to hang out with you and ashley gad um, at podcast movement in anaheim and really got to know you guys and it was so much fun and we were hanging out as as podcasters but i'd also love for you to share with our listeners what the what the coffee and crumbs website is which really is a collaborative blog to begin with so can you just tell that story maybe i know it wasn't it wasn't your blog that got started but maybe you can tell the story of how it got started and how you were involved and just what it is yeah yes which side note it was so fun to hang out with you guys um, last week and get to hang out in person i think um so yes the coffee and crumbs Ashley and I are good friends from Sacramento. So I used to live there for a number of years and we were in the same group of friends and shared mutual love of writing and worked in marketing at the time, which you'll often see with a lot of people who I think are creatives and now doing their own side Mm -hmm. businesses. They've got that, you know, a lot of times actually wanted to create a blog for moms that was a collaborative blog to offer just a variety of experiences around motherhood and recognizing that every motherhood journey looks a little different. And yet oftentimes we can see universal themes in each other's experiences that we can find encouraging. Mm -hmm. And so she decided to start the blog in, I think 2014, right before she had her second baby and invited a group of, of women that she knew from some that she knew like me in person and others that she had just read their work online and appreciated Mm -hmm. the work that they were putting out. And so she extended that invite to about 10 people. And so we started with just regular writers and then very quickly started adding guest submissions. And so The site um, now has essays three times a week and is open for submissions a few times a year. We accept guest submissions. And then the podcast spun off in 2016 and we're in our second season. And um, there's also been the addition of a book this last year called The Magic of Motherhood, which was so fun for all of us to, to work on. It was a dream come true for all of us to be able to see our words in actual physical print. So that was really fun. And we now have a, an, another side project called the year of creativity. And it's a group of women that basically are doing a full year of creative prompts and writing exercises from all of us writers. Um, so that's also kind of fun and different. It's so cool. Well, what I, what I noticed from the outside being a little different about coffee and crumbs is the really narrative essay style. So, I mean, Megan, Megan blogged from like back in the olden days and I jumped on the bandwagon circa 2010. And I feel like right when you guys launched was when things had kind of officially shifted to, I want to say like a lot more image driven, Pinterest driven stuff or Mm -hmm. lists, you know, lists and um, service pieces that were much more like either how to's or funny lists, but a lot less essay essay style blogging, Um, which is I know what drew Megan into blogging and me into blogging. And I feel like that kind of fell off the radar. So I love that there is this thriving place where these are stories and they're beautifully written. I almost feel like it's like a slower pace to consuming Mm -hmm. that kind of media. That's how I feel like when I look at your site and when I read something um, and, and that's not to knock other, there's lots of forms of online media that are great for moms and informative. So it's not to knock any other style. I just think it's sort of unique what you guys have done. And its success tells me that there are still moms out there who want to read a beautifully written motherhood essay, which honestly is what drew me into this world years and years ago before I was even writing for it. I was reading those types of essays. So I love that it is still 
there and still thriving and then it turned into a book so um, for our listeners who don't know what is the URL I'll just have you say it so I don't mess it up but it's coffee and crumbs coffee and crumbs dot net okay the and URL. of course we'll link that in the show notes so if you're not familiar um, just yeah beautifully written essays okay and then it turned into a podcast and the podcast is a little bit your baby correct you're the main host and then you rotate co-hosts is that how yeah so um yes so there's three of us that co-host and I'm always on there and uh, Ashley and April kind of take turns and a lot of times we'll do episodes with all three of us together depending on people's schedule so um, well it is really fun to listen to I listened to a couple of recent episodes you had Jen Hatmaker on who was a really mm-hmm. fun interview um, and I was just listening to this latest one where you and Ashley talked a little bit about some of the same um, school topics that you and I touched on so um Um, I think all of our listeners are listening to your podcast, but if there are any out there who aren't, definitely go check that out. Um, What has surprised you most about podcasting as opposed to writing? I think I've been surprised at how much I've enjoyed it. Yeah. I had no, I had no idea what to expect because I didn't, I didn't really talk to anyone that was doing it before we jumped in and I did tons of research, but didn't actually discuss with, yeah. I didn't know anyone who was podcasting. So yeah. I, I've been surprised at how much I've enjoyed it. I've been surprised at how much work it is. I, I kind of anticipated that it would be, but it definitely is. It takes a lot of time. Right. And I've also been surprised at just how much people like it and like the work that we're producing. I think that with any creative endeavor that I've ever done, the motivation has never been like, I want to create an award winning podcast or right. I want to create you know, essays that are going to be shared a hundred million times on the New York times. If those things happen, you know, great, but it's always been, I want to fulfill some kind of creative burning desire yeah. in my body that I just can't get rid of. And I love being able to try a new medium. So that's, that's kind of why I got into podcasting. And so it's been fun to, it's been fun to have a nice reception and to know that people are listening and that they enjoy it. I, yeah, but, I, yeah. I love that. And I think, I know Megan and I found having come from writing first that the, the kinds of people who who listen and engage with you in the podcasting world just are they're more engaged I would say than people who read a blog post and I think that's partly the way we consume podcasts like we're maybe we're on a walk or we're driving in our car and it's a little bit more like you're actually spending time with that person as opposed to reading a blog post on a Mm -hmm. screen but I don't know if you guys have found that too it just seems like the people who listen are really listening as opposed to you know scrolling Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I get the sense that they come back episode after episode and that they really feel like they know us and they, they probably do more so than reading any of our essays. I mean, the, the audible voice is such a powerful form of communication and we can get a lot across in a yeah. short amount of time. And so it's it is sweet to meet people that are listening and to hear that that they feel like they've connected with us. And that is our hope that people feel, you know, a deep connection to what we're putting out there. I love that. Well, we are going to wrap up and remind our listeners where to find and follow you. Um, so coffeeandcrumbs.net um, is where to find anything more about Coffee and Crumbs and the podcast. You can also search for the Coffee and Crumbs podcast anywhere you find podcasts. And how about social media? Do you want to draw people anywhere to your social profiles or Coffee and Crumbs? Where can they find you? Sure. Um I have, I'm on Instagram as Leslie Miller and Coffee and Crumbs is, is also on Instagram as Coffee and Crumbs and Coffee and Crumbs has a great Instagram feed. Yes, I, it does. I would say I'm pretty boring on Instagram. I mean, there's nothing, um, I don't have the eye for beauty and photography. So my photos are just snapshots I've taken of my kids and, you know, stuff that we're doing. But Coffee and Crumbs is, is a really pretty Instagram feed and site to look at. And Coffee and Crumbs is on Facebook and Twitter as well as Coffee and Crumbs. So you can find us kind of everywhere. Um, and then I have, I have a personal blog too, that I very occasionally update. So Leslie M.com okay, is perfect. where you can find some of my stuff. Well, we will link to those in the show notes for our listeners. Show notes are always at the This was episode 17 in our mom, hour voices series, which is what we call our interview series. So Leslie, thank you so much for 
taking time. I know you had napping babies and work schedules, and um, I'm just so appreciative that you took the time to be with us. It is such a pleasure, and thank you for just kind of um, leading the way for me with three kids and telling me what I have to look forward to next. It's really a pleasure to always spend time with you and to kind of see what's what's next for me. Well, so. I love that. Hopefully, we can stay connected a long time, and I'll always be three or four years ahead yes. of you and tell you what's next. Yeah, don't tell me the bad stuff to come. Just no. tell me the nope. good stuff. Just the good stuff. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, Leslie. Bye. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Hi everyone, Megan here. Sarah and I would absolutely love it if you would hit pause right now, like right where you're listening, and leave the Mom Hour a rating and review. If our show has helped you feel a little more confident as a mom or a little less alone, this is one of the biggest ways you can thank us, and it really only takes about 30 seconds. If you're listening to Apple Podcasts, you can navigate to the Mom Hour's show listing. So when you're in the episode you're listening to right now, click where it says the Mom Hour just above the play button and then scroll all the way to the bottom and you will see the ratings and reviews. We would love if you would leave us one as well. Thank you so much for listening. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like Chatbooks. Chatbooks makes it beyond easy to create beautiful photo books by importing your digital photos from anywhere, Instagram, Facebook, Google Photos, or directly from your phone. The books come in a variety of sizes with beautiful cover options and binding styles to choose from, and they start at just $15. Plus, we have a great deal just for our listeners. Use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20% off your purchase. Just download the Chatbooks app and use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20%.